I'm willing to die. I'm willing to give up my life. Find out the truth on Burke. I can't live without justice for Burke. I can't go on with my own life. That's all I can think. I want justice. The morning of September 6, 1997 began casually for 19-year-old Brooke Baker, a student of journalism at Vincennes University, Indiana. Her investigation into a date drug used by some campus fraternity guys had caused some friction between her and the fraternity guys. Despite their threats, she was determined to expose their crimes, which earned her praise from her journalism teachers. On September 7, 1997, Brooke's 18-year-old brother, Braun Baker, stopped for a visit at her house off campus as he normally did. They had a strong bond, and he had a key to her home. But when he called out her name, he received no response. As he ventured deeper into the house, what he saw left him haunted forever. What did Braun Baker see in his sister's home that distressed him so much? Or was he just hallucinating? Welcome back to M7 Crime Story Time, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Today, we're looking at the tragic case of Brooke Baker. Today's story takes us to the historic city of Vincennes in Knox County, Indiana. Founded by French fur traders in 1732, Vincennes was the site of several important events during the American Revolution and the Northwest Indian War. Vincennes is also the oldest continually inhabited European settlement in Indiana and has a rich and diverse heritage. According to the 2020 census, the city has a population of 16,000, steadily decreasing since the 1990s. With its location on the Wabash River, the city offers a variety of recreational attractions to residents and visitors alike. Vincennes had a relatively high crime rate in 1997, with a violent crime rate of 514.6 per 100,000 people. It was this city that was Brooke Baker's home. Brooke Elizabeth Baker was born on April 24, 1978 in Vincennes, Indiana. She was the daughter of Janet and Maurice Baker. She grew up in a low-income family with her parents and younger brother Braun, but she never let that stop her from pursuing her dreams. Brooke's heart beat with a passion for words. From a young age, she dreamt of becoming a writer, using the power of storytelling to captivate and inspire. In August 1996, she embarked on a new chapter as she was accepted into Vincennes University, Indiana's oldest college. Brooke studied journalism and wrote for the campus newspaper, The Trailblazer. She was an ambitious and talented reporter and wasn't afraid to tackle controversial topics. Brooke was kind, loving, smart, and knew what she wanted out of life. Brooke was also a friendly and outgoing person who made friends easily and enjoyed life. She was close to her family and often called her mother to chat and share her feelings. She hoped to transfer to a bigger university after completing her two-year program at Vincennes. Brooke was living with a friend and his roommates while attending university and was dating another student casually. But her main focus was her career as a writer. She wanted to cover hard-hitting stories for the school paper, especially about the fraternities on campus. They had a lot of influence and also a lot of scandals. No one doubted that Brooke had a bright future ahead of her. But little did anyone know that her zeal to cover hard-hitting stories would lead to a tragic outcome. In the spring of 1997, 19-year-old Brooke began working on an investigative story about an assault case that had happened at a frat house. The campus fraternity involved in the matter had covered up the crime. Some of Brooke's friends were in that fraternity, but they didn't want to talk about it. Brooke managed to identify the victim and tried to interview her, but the victim backed out after being pressured by the fraternity members. Brooke spoke to several women who had similar encounters with the frat members. However, the fraternity did not appreciate her probing into the case. They sent her threatening messages and emails, warning her to stop the investigation. However, Brooke was not one to be intimidated and continued her investigation, but her mother, Janet Baker, was worried about her well-being. Brooke assured her mother that she was pursuing the story to prevent others from being harmed. But the warnings continued. One time, Brooke was at a friend's place when a truck full of frat guys showed up and threatened her. Brooke's friends were concerned about her, and in July 1997, for safety reasons, Brooke moved to a new apartment off campus where the landlord was a campus cop. But come what may, she was determined to expose the truth and refused to give up on the story. 
On September 7, 1997, Brooke's 18-year-old brother, Bron Baker, visited her at her off-campus house. The siblings were very close, and he had a key to her place. He called her name, but got no reply. He noticed that the water was running in the bathroom and turned it off. He went further into the house, looking for his sister. But what he found in Brooke's house was a horrifying scene. Bron Baker, overwhelmed with grief upon discovering his sister's tragic fate, somehow managed to compose himself enough to call the police. When the police arrived at the scene, they found Brooke lying naked on a mattress in her bedroom. She'd been stabbed multiple times and bore bruises suggesting she'd been tied up and assaulted. There was no sign of forced entry in the house, but the injuries on her arms were enough evidence of a fierce fight between Brooke and her killer. I went up to a state policeman and I told him, I said, I'm going in there. He said, no, you can't go in there. That's my granddaughter in there, and I think I have a right to go in there. And he said, there's a lot of evidence in there, and we don't want nobody fooling with it. The killer had tried to clean up the crime scene. A towel was in the bathtub, a bleach bottle and two dishwashing liquid bottles were on the floor. A soapy knife, suspected to be the murder weapon, was found in the kitchen sink. The police also collected a DNA sample from Brooke's body that did not belong to her. Brooke's vibrant future had met a horrifying end in her own home. Police were determined to give the young woman the justice she deserved. The forensics team sent the DNA sample from Brooke's body for analysis. They also collected other materials from the crime scene that would be useful in the investigation. The police began by questioning Braun, who reluctantly revealed that his sister, Brooke, had been romantically involved with another student. The police pursued the lead and were able to contact and question Brooke's boyfriend. According to her boyfriend, they'd attended a party the night before her body was found. Brooke had left the party early while he remained behind. The boyfriend's alibi, however, couldn't be confirmed due to the influence of alcohol on him and his friends while at the party. The police then reached out to Brooke's journalism teachers and peers, hoping to uncover potential suspects. During their inquiries, they learned about her investigative work regarding the campus fraternities. Brooke's friend told the police that the fraternity members were angry at Brooke for exposing their secrets. They'd left a threatening note on her door at the previous house, warning her to stop writing the story. The threats came in her first year of school, close to the end of the school semester. It was the fraternity. Determined, the police decided to question the fraternity members and possible witnesses. The police had three main theories about who could have killed Brooke. The first theory pointed to the campus fraternity members who were displeased with Brooke's investigation at Vincennes University. The police interviewed several fraternity members including two of Brooke's friends who were in the frat. They all denied any involvement in Brooke's murder, but the police added them to the list of suspects. The list kept growing as the police continued their investigation. The second theory involved Brooke's landlord, who was also a campus police officer and had a key to Brooke's house. She told her friends and family that he'd often enter her apartment without warning or permission. One night, he'd shone a flashlight into her bedroom while she was sleeping. Another night, he came in while she was taking a shower. Brooke had felt uncomfortable and scared by his behavior. The police believed that he may have used his key to get into her apartment that night and killed her after a confrontation. There were also troubling allegations against him, as some women had accused him of voyeuristic behavior on campus. However, when the landlord was questioned, he refuted the claim of unauthorized entry, claiming that he'd entered for pest control purposes. He maintained that he'd been at work throughout the night when Brooke was murdered. The third theory pointed to an unknown suspect, a John Doe who had pretended to be a potential roommate. Brooke had placed an ad in the campus newspaper seeking a roommate, and the police believed that this John Doe may have seen it and contacted her. She may have let him in, thinking he's interested in renting the room, and then he attacked and killed her. This theory was supported by the fact that there was no sign of forced entry in her apartment. The police had the DNA sample of the killer, which they obtained from Brooke's body. They tested the landlord and Brooke's boyfriend, but neither of them matched the DNA, so they were eventually ruled out as suspects. Because John Doe was unknown and mostly a theory, there was no way to pursue him. As the investigation deepened, the focus shifted back to the fraternity members. Approximately 65 males willingly provided DNA samples. Regrettably, none of the samples matched the killer's DNA. There was no other physical evidence or witnesses to link anyone to the crime. 
The police even questioned Brooke's cousin, who'd lived with her for a while before moving to California one week before her murder. However, the cousin was uncooperative and refused to answer any questions from the investigators. The police didn't know what she knew about the case or if she was involved in it. The police were frustrated and baffled by the lack of leads. They wondered who could have killed Brooke and why. There were no witnesses to the crime and the DNA sample didn't match anyone in the criminal database. The police searched for the killer across different states and took DNA samples from many people, but none of them matched. Brooke's parents, along with other family and friends, were desperately hoping for answers, but the police were unable to find the murderer. The distraught family buried Brooke in Wheatland Cemetery in Knox County, Indiana. It was a sad day for the Baker family and the Vincennes community at large. Nevertheless, the family did not give up. They hoped that someone would come forward with new information or evidence that would help solve the mystery of their daughter's murder. Someone that's listening to me tonight has that answer concerning my daughter's murder. I'm going to die. I'm going to give up my life. Find out the truth on Brooke. I can't live without justice for Brooke. I can't go on with my own life. That's all I can think. I want justice. Despite all efforts, Brooke Baker's case soon went cold until the spring of 1999. On July 5, 1999, the police got a call about a missing student at Vincennes University, and they rushed to the flat of 21-year-old Erica Norman. As knocks on the door went unanswered, the police felt a sense of dread. They broke in and found a scene of horror that was oddly familiar. It was a slaughterhouse that eerily matched another case. Erica Elaine Norman was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana, on November 13, 1977, to Kenneth and Elaine Norman. Erica grew up in a happy and large family with three siblings and several nieces and nephews. She also adored her dog, Smokey. Erica was a standout student and her academic prowess was matched by her passion for extracurricular activities, such as softball, gymnastics, singing, and her involvement in the drama club, science club, and the Spanish Honor Society. Her enthusiasm for learning extended to exploring different cultures. At Vincennes University, she pursued radio and television studies fueled by her passion for media and communication. While at college, Erica worked part-time jobs where her kindness and humor endeared her to colleagues. She treasured her high school, college, and sorority friends who loved her for her cheerful and caring personality. However, on July 4, 1999, Erica's life took a dark turn. That night, she was seen leaving a local restaurant with a stranger she met there. The next day, she was reported missing by her friends who hadn't seen her since the previous night. On July 5, 1999, when investigators arrived to reach Erica Norman's apartment, they were shocked to discover a nearly identical crime scene to Brooke Baker's. It was very strange. I walked in the door and took one tour around the apartment and I called Greg Winkler. And I said, you need to get over here. And I told him we have it again. I just knew. However, Erica's body was nowhere to be found. There was no sign of forced entry, yet the apartment looked like the scene of a violent struggle. There was blood splattered on the walls, a lamp that had been smashed, and a table that had been knocked over. A pair of shorts stained with blood were also lying on the floor. The bathroom was equally disturbing. The police found a bottle of bleach on the counter and couch cushions soaking in the bathtub. The water was still running from the faucet, just like it had been in Brooke's apartment. It seemed that the killer had tried to clean up the evidence, but had left in a hurry. The police learned that Erica had been at a bar called the Green Parrot the night before she disappeared. She'd been seen with a man named Brian Jones who'd bought her drinks and danced with her. The name Brian Jones carried an unsettling familiarity. It turned out that this very Brian Jones had been the roommate of Brooks's boyfriend at the time Brooke had been murdered two years ago. The police tracked down Brian and took him to the station for questioning. He was very agreeable and friendly. He confessed that he'd met Erica at the bar and accompanied her to her apartment to watch a movie. He claimed that Erica fell asleep on the couch and he'd left her apartment quietly. Brian seemed very cooperative with the detectives who were investigating Erica's disappearance. He agreed to give them his DNA sample and the clothes he'd worn the previous night with Erica at the restaurant. He also allowed them to search his car and house without any resistance. Brian had no criminal record. The police began searching for Erica's body and even sought help from the public. 
Two weeks after her disappearance, on July 20, 1999, Erica's body was discovered in a plastic tub in a cornfield in Lawrence County, Illinois. And a farmer was going by one of his fields, and he walked into the field about 40 or 50 feet in, and he found Erica. Based on the DNA evidence recovered from Erica's body, the police charged Brian Jones with killing her. The police also suspected that Brian held the key to unlocking a cold case from two years earlier, Brooke Baker's murder. Brian had left town shortly after Brooke was killed, but he'd returned in 1999. He was now the prime suspect in both murders, since the crime scene and method in both cases were disturbingly familiar. The police still had the unknown DNA sample they'd retrieved from Brooke's body. They decided to test Brian's DNA against it. The result was a perfect match. The police suspected that Brian had visited Brooke's house after a party. Brooke had let him in since she considered him a friend. However, Brian had another motive and tried to force himself on Brooke. When she resisted, he assaulted and killed her. He then tried to wash away the blood and DNA in the bathtub. Brian Jones was charged with the murder of Brooke Baker as well. In 2000, Brian Jones faced separate trials for killing Erica Norman and Brooke Baker. Brian confessed to murdering Erica, but he pleaded not guilty to the assault and murder of Brooke. The prosecution presented a compelling case against Brian, showcasing evidence of arguments indicating his involvement in Brooke's murder. They demonstrated Brooke's whereabouts before her death, the presence of a knife with her DNA in the sink, and Brian's connections to her. Brian's party attendance on the night of the murder, a suspicious scratch on his face, and inconsistencies in his statements further raised suspicion. DNA evidence linked him to the crime scene, and his recent rental of a movie featuring a similar murder scene added to the case against him. However, Brian's attorneys claimed that the evidence presented was insufficient to convict him of murder. They argued that the evidence did not prove that he'd assaulted and killed Brooke Baker. There is no way to conclusively prove that the intercourse happened at the same time as the murder, that it was forced by him, or that he was the one who stabbed her. Brian's attorneys claimed that the evidence only raised suspicion and possibilities, not certainty beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecutors, however, disagreed and said that the convictions for murder and assault were supported by circumstantial evidence and the reasonable inferences that could be drawn from it. They highlighted the presence of Brian's DNA on Brooke's fingernails and intimate areas, the scratch on his face the day after the murder, and the similarity of the murder scene to a movie that he'd rented shortly before. Brian's attorneys claimed that the trial court wrongly excluded a statement that Brooke herself had made shortly before she was killed. The night before her body was found in her apartment, a friend had walked Brooke home and they'd seen her landlord drive by. Brooke had told her friend that she was scared of the landlord. The trial court had agreed with the prosecution's request to keep this evidence out, but Brian's team argued that this evidence should be allowed because it fits the present sense impression exception to Indiana's hearsay rule, meaning that if someone sees something and tells someone else about it right away, their statement can be used as evidence even if they're not in court. On December 14, 2000, Brian Jones was found guilty of assaulting and killing Brooke Baker. The trial court, following the jury's recommendation, sentenced him to a life sentence without parole. He was also sentenced to 60 years for the murder of Erica Norman and got an extra 20 years for the assault conviction. Brian Jones is currently serving out his sentence in the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility in Sullivan County, Indiana. Brooks's father, Maurice Baker, was pleased with the sentence. We're satisfied. We know we have the right person and maybe he won't be able to harm anyone anymore, he said face to this animal it helps a little bit. It will still be something that we will deal with the rest of our lives. He said in that courtroom with no expression, stone cold, no remorse. He ain't human. Sadly, Brooke's mother, Janet Baker, passed away in 2004. However, Brooke's brother, Braun, still fondly remembers his sister and the happy memories of growing up together. It's really hard to have a favorite memory of her because we were so close in age. All of my childhood memories involved her, he said. Brooke is also fondly remembered by her friends and teachers at Vincennes University. Michael Mullen, a former English and journalism professor at the university, described Brooke as a lively and ambitious student. When she was around, you knew she was there. Brooke was ambitious, fearless, and had a great personality. She wasn't afraid to approach people and loved to learn new things, he said. 
To honor Brooks' spirit and passion for journalism, the Indiana Collegiate Press Association, ICPA, created an award in her name in 1999. The Brooke Baker Indiana Collegiate Journalist of the Year Award is given every year to an Indiana college student journalist who's inspired to make a difference in the world with their writing. Justice can be delayed, but not denied. Brooke Baker's family and friends had to wait for two years before her killer was arrested and convicted. They had not given up on finding out who killed their beloved daughter and friend. Do you think that justice was served for Brooke Baker and Erica Norman? Do you agree with the court sentence? Or would a death sentence have been more fitting for the crimes Brian Jones committed? Let us know what you think in the comments section. We hope Brooke's story inspires you to stand for the truth and what you believe in. Let her story move you to stand strong in the face of injustice as she did. Thank you for tuning in to our channel. We hope you enjoyed the content and found it informative. Please show your support by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. We also encourage you to leave a comment below as we genuinely appreciate your feedback and love hearing from our viewers. If you have any case suggestions or topics you'd like us to cover in future videos, please let us know. Until next time, stay safe out there.